Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I am your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thank you to our generous underwriters on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Tuesday, September 6th, we are studying Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 1 to 21. Moses gives Israel instructions concerning cities of refuge in the promised land. He speaks about why you shouldn't move your neighbor's boundary marker. And he also tells the people of the necessity of having at least two witnesses to establish criminal wrongdoing. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Sean Kilgo. Pastor Kilgo serves at Redeemer Lutheran Church in Lawrence, Kansas. Pastor Kilgo, welcome back to Sharper Iron. It's good to be back. Let's talk a little context to get started. What should we know leading up to Deuteronomy 19 today? Well, I think the the biggest thing is that the Lord in Deuteronomy 18 through Moses has kind of wrapped up the discussion of uh, essentially the first table of the law. I mean, there's been some other stuff that they will repeat a little bit, but uh, up to this point, it's been primarily stuff dealing with first table of the law, uh, the proper worship of God, keeping his word, this this sort of stuff. And now 19 has kind of this distinct shift into second table sort of stuff and how we're going to deal in love with our neighbor. And and that's really what's what's pushing here. All right. So dealing in love with the neighbor, we've got a text that maybe seems anticlimactic after the previous one. Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 22 is the most important text in Deuteronomy, Martin Luther tells us, because it speaks of Christ. And yet what is given in chapter 19 is not unimportant, but it is important. How do we how do we tie these subjects together? They seem a little, I mean, is it just love for the neighbor, or is there anything more connecting cities of refuge and property boundaries and and witnesses and trials? Well, I mean, all this is ultimately going to be connected um, with the the person and work of God, right? So, I, I think maybe one of the clearest examples of how this works out is in Psalm fifty one, where David is uh, reflecting on his sin with Bathsheba, uh, and you know he's he sinned not only against Bathsheba but against Uriah, against the nation of Israel, all these things. And he makes this comment in there against you, you only have I sinned and done what is wicked in your sight. And so we, we understand that any sin against the neighbor is fundamentally a sin against God who has given the neighbor to us for our good and for our service. So, uh, so the, we, we want to make sure that the two tables are connected. And, and Jesus does this as well. When he's asked, what's the greatest commandment? He says, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And a second is like it. Um, that is, it, it, the second is of the same substance as it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Th- these aren't distinct things. And I think one of our issues when we engage the commandments is that we tend to treat them as either individual on their own, like each commandment is its own self-contained little thing, or even if we understand the two tables, that those are completely distinct, that we should love God and that's over here and we should love God, our neighbor and that's over there and never the two shall meet. And and that's simply not the way the Lord lays this all out for us. And and, and that's part of what we're going to see in here. There, there is this overlap, especially in the end of Deuteronomy 19, uh, that very clearly deals uh, with, with the person of Christ and his work for us. But even with the... Um, how we're treating our neighbor, uh, especially like the cities of ref- refuge and whatnot, uh, treating these people as those whom our Lord has died for, those whom our Lord has redeemed, those whom our Lord has created, right? We're, we're not to, to treat them as just, you know, property or uh, uh, something that we can just toss away or something like that. With that introduction in mind, let us take a look at the text for today in Deuteronomy 19. Moses continues speaking. When the Lord your God cuts off the nations whose land the Lord your God is giving you, 
and you dispossess them and dwell in their cities and in their houses, you shall set apart three cities for yourselves in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. You shall measure the distances and divide into three parts the area of the land that the Lord your God gives you as a possession, so that any manslayer may, can flee to them. This is the provision for the manslayer, who by fleeing there may save his life. If anyone kills his neighbor unintentionally, without having hated him in the past, as when someone goes into the forest with his neighbor to cut wood, and his hand swings the axe to cut down a tree, and the head slips from the handle and strikes his neighbor so that he dies, he may flee to one of these cities and live, lest the avenger of blood in hot anger pursue the manslayer and overtake him, because the way is long, and strike him fatally, though the man did not deserve to die, since he has not hated his neighbor in the past. Therefore I command you, you shall set apart three cities. And if the Lord your God enlarges your territory, as he has sworn to your fathers, and gives you all the land that he promised to give to your fathers, provided you are careful to keep all this commandment, which I command you today by loving the Lord your God, and by walking ever in his ways, then you shall add three other cities to these three, lest innocent blood be shed in your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, and so the guilt of bloodshed be upon you. But if anyone hates his neighbor, and lies in wait for him, and attacks him, and strikes him fatally so that he dies, and he flees into one of these cities, then the elders of his city shall send and take him from there, and hand him over to the avenger of blood, so that he may die. Your eye shall not pity him, but you shall purge the guilt of innocent blood from Israel, so that it may be well with you. You shall not move your neighbor's landmark, which the men of old have set, in the inheritance that you will hold in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently, and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. And the rest shall hear and fear, and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. That's our text for today. That's Deuteronomy 19, verses 1 to 21. Pastor Kilgo, as, as we've said, there's three primary topics here. Cities of refuge, where your landmarkers lie, and witnesses for crime. So let's start with the cities of refuge. Take us into that first section. Yeah, so th- there, there's actually already three sli- cities of refuge that have been set up. I, I believe they are to the... Um, to the east, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, That's correct. And uh, these are three more. And then there's this provision here that if the Lord enlarges the territory, that there'll be three more on top of that. So the, the indication is there's going to be like nine of these total. And what these are is places where if somebody accidentally kills somebody else, uh, then they can go to this area and it's an area where they don't have to worry about. Um, uh, having vengeance taken out upon them. So uh, remember all the way back in Genesis uh, 4, uh, I believe it's uh, Lamech, uh, is is kind of boasting about how he's gone and, and just like killed other guys um, uh, for like l- looking at him the wrong way, basically, um, or, or looking at... Uh, uh, I, I forget exactly what it is, um, but but it's like this sort of thing, like that the person didn't do anything against him, and he just goes off and he and he and he kills him, right? So uh, th- this would be a place where they could be protected uh, in that way, um, and we're get, you you get this um, avenger of blood uh, person in here a couple times, and and where you see really clearly who that is, is towards the end where the person who is guilty of of murder. Uh, not incidental, uh, accidental killing that that person is handed over by the elders to 
the avenger of blood that is anything executioner here so that so this gets into the whole idea in the scriptures that uh we we do not have the right of personal vengeance uh in in most instances uh against our neighbor that this is an authority that is handed to the state so so here it's it's with the elders of the city to take care of this uh you know for us it would be our legal system uh so so it's not for us to go and deal with this and and this is where the lord promises vengeance is mine i will repay so so that the uh the murderer will be repaid one way or another by the lord um either in this life and or in the life to come, depending on the sort of sin that's been committed and if there's repentance that is there. But for the for the one who accidentally uh, kills his neighbor, they, they don't have to worry about some sort of retribution because they're in this kind of sanctuary sort of city. And you've got the example of the, the axe uh, uh, just kind of flying off the handle uh, and striking somebody in in numbers, there there's there's a few more of these that um, that get uh, discussed. Where um, uh, one of which is if you're like walking around with these big rocks, at, at, and I, I think this is like a reference, to like you're you're building uh, something, mm-hmm. and like you accidentally drop the rock, and somebody's walking by, and the rock falls on them, and they die. Well, you're you're not. Uh, you're not responsible for that in the sense that you are going to be put to death for murder, but you would be kind of sent off to one of these sanctuary cities. That way you didn't have to worry about some sort of retribution. So there, there's a number of instances. Um, this particular area where they're at is very forested where they're settling here. So it that might be, might be why Moses is giving this particular example. Um, uh, one of the commentaries mentioned that it, it may be that this has actually happened. That's why it's like such a specific example. Right. Uh, right. L- Luther mentions another one where um, a uh, he he said, I, I knew a man who was going to uh, kill a boar that had tackled another man and in the process stabbed the other man um, as another example of this. So so the guy was not intending to kill uh, the, the other guy. He was trying to actually save him and resulted in killing him. Uh, and so the whole deal is, is there malice in the heart? And and this goes into how our Lord will actually take up the fifth commandment in the gospels, particularly in the Beatitudes, where he says, you've heard it said of old, you shall not uh, murder and whoever murders will be liable to uh, judgment. But I say to you, whoever hates his brother um, has uh, is, is liable to the, um, to the council uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So the, the, the issue of the murder is, uh, deeper than the action itself. The action is a fruit of, um, in, in the case of actually breaking the fifth commandment, the action is a fruit of what, uh, the person already harbors in their own heart. And, and, and that's, what's being guarded against here is people being unjustly punished, um, for the action when there was no malice in the heart. Mm. The Lord's concern for justice here, I think, comes through, and I think this ties the chapter together as well. I'm reminded of the end of Deuteronomy 16, where Moses told the people to appoint judges and officers so that the Lord's justice would happen. And I mean, over and over again in that just very short section, justice, only justice you shall follow and pursue. We've talked about in Deuteronomy how justice is intimately tied to keeping the word of the Lord. And to see how you know he works it out here in his word in very practical ways, I think is, is quite wonderful. That I mean, when you when you read this, like this makes sense that the Lord would deal with things in this way. It's it is a very just way of of preserving order among his people. It's also a very merciful way of preserving order among his people so that they don't you know, slip into that desire for vengeance that would exist in, in any of our hearts should a loved one be killed, even in an accidental way. You know, the the provision that these cities need to be spaced throughout the land so that no one in Israel is all that far from from them so that they can get to a city before the avenger might overtake them in hot anger. I mean, just the the whole description, it, it speaks very true to life. And you see how the Lord is very concerned for the good of his people, for giving them true justice under his word, and for having it carried out in this way. 
Right. And, and, and this is, um, I mean, you, you mentioned this, but this is a really important uh, point to emphasize is that all of us have this, uh, this temptation in our hearts to seek vengeance anytime we are sinned against. Uh, there is always the temptation to uh, try and get back or get one up, right? And th this is especially true when there is harm to one of our loved ones, right? You, you see this all the time um, when, I, I think you see especially with uh, fathers for their, for their children and particularly for their daughters when, when they see that they have been uh, harmed uh, or killed, that uh, one of the, the biggest threats that, I mean, even our own law enforcement agencies will, will do this. They will seek to protect the, uh, the murderer so that they can stand trial uh, from the fathers in particular, because there is this great tendency to, uh, to protect our children uh, even in their death, right? Um, which, which is not necessarily a bad, uh, a bad motivator. Like it's, it's good to want to protect your children and good to want to protect your family and your loved ones and whatnot. But we have to realize that the Lord has placed limits on us in those and that he's given he's given the state ultimately to hand out uh, justice and vengeance in this life and that he promises that one way or another he will have vengeance uh, over all those who break his commandments in the life of the world to come right so so that we can we can actually trust that vengeance or that that Vengeance and uh, uh, justice will occur, um, and we don't have to take that into our own hands. Well, and I think there, there's, again, mercy on the Lord's part in not putting that in our hands, because in our zeal for justice, so often we would go farther than justice actually is. And the Lord knows what is truly just and right, and we don't always have that full conception. And I, I think you see that coming through in this first part about these cities of refuge. And, and I think it's going to come up again when we talk about the very last verse of our text, the, the matter of life for life, eye for eye, and so on, that in, in our own execution of justice, if we were to do that according to our own will that is warped by sin, we would get it wrong. We'd either be too lenient or we would be too harsh. We, we wouldn't get it. And, and the Lord showing his people what true justice is, again, is a great mercy so that justice can actually be done, that his will actually is done among them. That's what he desires. And so, I, yeah, I, I think that's another thing that, that really ties this whole chapter together. Right. And I mean, we, we have to remember that, too, like in, in terms of meting out justice, that this is what the Lord is, in fact, doing uh, at the cross, Right, so um, I, I was trying to remember what what hymn it is, but one of our uh, Holy Week hymns uh, actually uses this language: the 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 sharpest blow uh, upon Christ was the blow that justice made. Um, yeah, it's it's stricken, smitten, and afflicted. Right, right, um, and so uh, yeah, the deepest stroke that pierced him was the strike that justice gave. Right, that that the Lord in killing his son for our sake uh, is meting out uh, the, the, the truest form of justice, right? That, that the Lord is suffering the just consequences for sin, but he's showing us um, may, maybe the proper way to go about doing that, and that is through a, a self-sacrifice, right? And so you know, that this is, you know, obviously none of us are Jesus and, and we don't want to go down that road, but it is, uh, it, it does teach us something about how we ought to, uh, handle these things in, in a couple of ways. One, um, are we, are we trying to approach things like justice in a self-serving sort of manner, um, or in a sacrificial manner, um, then ask that question. And then also to remember that our Lord has already um, meted out the justice for these things upon himself. Um, mm. and so, you know, that all these things, like, like you mentioned, all these things are ultimately guarding us against ourselves, right? 
and and this is something maybe we forget about the commandments as a whole and this is certainly just a this this whole section is um and you know most of deuteronomy is is just taking the commandments and just kind of expanding on how these actually interact in our lives but that the commandments are set up to protect our neighbor from us right so especially the second table so that our neighbor would be protected in the fifth commandment from our misguided attempts for justice and vindication and vengeance and whatnot right mm-hmm. um and and that's and that's kind of what's going on here and i think that's helpful to remember that you know the the lord is not protecting our neighbor from some far off force they're they're protecting protecting them from us and we're there he's also protecting us from us you know so that we don't go afield i appreciate you bringing up the holy week hymn that talks about justice and how justice is done on the cross and the reason i, I find that particularly striking in this text is the very last verse of the section concerning cities of refuge verse 13 where where moses is telling not in the case of a, a manslayer who killed someone accidentally, but an actual murder, someone who killed with intent in his heart to kill, he attempts to use the city of refuge for his benefit. He is not to receive that benefit because he is he has actually shed innocent blood. And the last verse of this, this section says, your eye shall not pity him, that murderer, but you shall purge the guilt of innocent blood from Israel so that it may be well with you. It's, it's striking that it it's actually the innocent blood of, of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that does purge the guilt from us. I mean, I think of in the, I think it's in Matthew's gospel where the, the people shout for his blood to be on them and their children, which right. they're willing to accept the guilt, but but that's actually what he came to do. And, and the cry of the, I believe the centurion, as Luke records, it said, surely this man was the innocent one. I mean, so it's it's quite striking that it's actually the innocent blood of Jesus that does remove our guilt. Right. And and also, like, you you can hear this echoing, uh, the, the, the I shall not pity him. You can hear the echoing of the prophet Isaiah in here where he's talking about how uh, he had no former majesty that we should admire him, uh, et, et cetera, that, that we read during holy week and that you know there there is no pity no no nobody's looking at jesus with pity right and i mean the the irony being like he's the one person who really rightly could receive pity uh, in this instance and nobody looks at him in that way uh uh because he's sitting there and he's taking all of our sins upon himself to, to die for them Right. And like you said, to, to purge the guilt uh, from Israel, right, through his innocent blood. So, yeah, th- this is there, there's there's all these little uh, sprinklings, so to speak, of uh, of, of the death of Jesus um, in, in this text in a, in a wonderful way. And, and I mean, we're going to see this, especially, I think, in the in the in the last section, too. That, that's right. So, I mean, in, in terms of the the cities of refuge, then you you mentioned there are three that have already been established on the east side of the Jordan River. Moses here tells them to set apart three more. There is this this command, if, if I'm reading it right, that it sounds like there's the potential for even having three more on top of that if the Lord enlarges them. As far as I know in the Old Testament, those other three are never established uh, making I mean, making me think that this part didn't come to pass simply because they did not keep the commandment as they were told. And so the other three are not established. But again, these are, are spaced throughout as, as a, a mercy from God so that there's a, a place for everyone to go. It, what other details within that section on the cities of refuge do we need to, to see? Um, I, I think that's probably it in the section. I'm, I'm sure there's all sorts of uh, things in here that we go into, but um, I, I, I think that's probably, uh, good on this. You, you are, I, I was reading this the, the same way that there's the possibility for nine total. Uh, there's definitely six. And as far as I could tell also, uh, those, um, that third set of three never comes to pass because it is conditional. Uh, he says, provided you are careful to keep all this commandment, which I command you today. 
uh, now it's, and now it's interesting that this goes back to what we said right at the beginning. What, what's the commandment that's commanded today? Uh, well, to love the Lord your God and by walking ever in his ways, right? So that mm-hmm. the, the, the provision of the, um, the innocent man being able to go to a sanctuary city here so that he's not um, improperly avenged, uh, that that is loving the Lord your God by doing that. So that the one of the ways in which we love God is by loving our neighbor and loving the things that he gives to us, right? And and Jesus brings us up in the, the sheep and the goats when he's talking about, um, uh, you know, I was hungry and you fed me and naked and you clothed me and in prison and you visited me, all these things. And the and the sheep are like, well, when did we do those? We don't remember doing those things. And he said, as often as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, that is to your neighbor, you did it also to me, right? So that mm. in in serving our neighbor, we are also serving God. In loving our neighbor, we are also loving God. And, and I think that's a big thing to see, um, not only this section, but in in the whole section as the second table is being unpacked. Yeah, that's right. That that phrase stood out to me too after the way you introduced it about you know loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, holding those two tables of law together, loving God, loving neighbor, never separate from each other. We're going to pick up more of this text on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking about Deuteronomy 19 with Pastor Sean Kilgo. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Tuesday, September 6th. We're studying Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 1 to 21 with Pastor Sean Kilgo. He serves at Redeemer Lutheran Church in Lawrence, Kansas. Pastor Kilgo, prior to the break, we looked at the first 13 verses, the cities of refuge. Three have already been established on the east side of the Jordan. The Lord provides for the establishing of three more as a mercy to show his people true justice. In verse 14, there is one verse that within this section deals with property and where the markers are and not moving them. This is a part of the Lord's inheritance. It's one verse, but there's a lot packed in there. Why this command about land markers? Yeah. So, so there was a, um, an, an issue that would periodically, uh, come up where the, so what the land markers were just in case the listener doesn't know is, it would usually be like a pile of rocks or something like that. Um, it wasn't generally a uh, a physical immovable landmark like a river. Sometimes it was, but very often you had like these pile of rocks and basically you're going to like mark out the perimeter of your, of your land, but that this land has come to you from God, right? And it's passed down within the family um, from generation to generation. And you, you'll get this periodically where people will comment on how this was the land given to my fathers. So, so it's, it's land given by God to a family for them to use. And, um, you, you can imagine then like if you wanted more land, well, all you've got to do is go and just kind of scoot the pile of rocks over. I mean, it's pretty easy to do. It's not like today where, you know, you, you live in a, in a neighborhood and you've got like a fence sitting between you and your, and your neighbor's house. And if you went out one day and you just like uprooted the fence and moved it towards their house, like five feet, it's going to be pretty obvious that you did that. Uh, so, so it's a lot more difficult for us to, to do things like what they would be able to do. So there is this, uh, this tendency and temptation to try and steal from the neighbor, uh, and to recognize that, when you're doing that, not only you're stealing from your neighbor, but you're also stealing from God because he's the one who's actually given it. It still belongs to the Lord. Um, all things belong to him. And so we need to treat this, um, as what the thing is, 
belonging to our neighbor and belonging to God uh, as a guard uh, against our own temptation for uh, greediness and covetousness. King Ahab gets in trouble for something like this. Maybe not exactly the same thing, but this matter that the, the land is an inheritance it becomes a pretty important and what it's a Naboth and his vineyard that he tries to take or does take. And he gets called out by, by the prophet. Right. Yeah. This, so this is in first Kings uh, 21. And, and this is actually a, a really good text in uh, kind of unpacking when, when St. Paul says that covetousness is idolatry, how, how the ninth and 10th commandments uh, have a direct link to the first commandment and how uh, all the sins against our neighbor are going to start with covetousness. Uh, and all our sins against God are going to start with covetousness, uh, that this is a great text to see how that actually happens because you, you can actually trace the breaking of all the commandments through this. So what happens is that um, you've got uh, Ahab, who's king of Samaria, and he sees um, uh, the, this land that's owned by Naboth, uh, who's a Jezreelite, and uh, he owns this vineyard. It's his land, and it's apparently fairly near to the um, to the king's palace. And so he says, uh, "Give me your vineyard so that I can have a vegetable garden, and I'll pay you for it, um, or I'll give you a different one um, that's you know of equal value, but just somewhere else." And Naboth says, um, "This is not mine to give. This is something that's been given to my family by the Lord as an inheritance to us. I can't sell it. I can't give it to you." Um, that that's um, the whole context. Everything else that flows from that narrative hinges on this: that the land has been given to Naboth uh, by the Lord, and and not just to Naboth, but to the entirety of his household, right? And and he says it's um, uh, Naboth's actual response is: "The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers," right? So so you can see how uh, how deeply this goes. And that's the same sort of thing going on here. It's the same language, the inheritance that you will hold in the land that the Lord, your God is giving you to possess, right? It, it's something uh, that we are inheriting from God, uh, uh, not only for our sake, but also for our family's sake and broadly for the sake of the community, right? So that, you know, if you're raising cattle or you're raising, uh, like in this case, you've got a vineyard and you've got grapes there or whatever it might be, that this is going to benefit the entirety of the community. Uh, so, so none of these things are entirely self-serving. Um, and, but, but again, it goes all the way back to God has given this for this purpose. And so I don't have the authority, even if I wanted to, I don't have the authority to sell it to you or to give it away or whatever it might be. Um, and, uh, by, uh, extension, then my neighbor doesn't have the authority to just come and take it, which is eventually what happens with Naboth, um, uh, Jezebel uh, comes in and uh, forges his signature and uh, sets up witnesses, which is going to occur in the next section, uh, false witnesses, and uh, forcibly takes Naboth's vineyard from him uh, by killing Naboth, right? So they get rid of Naboth and then they just take the vineyard. Um, and so you can see how uh, in guarding against the taking of the land itself, you're also guarding things like what we had in the previous section, murder, and you're guarding against things like false witnesses in the next section. So all the, all these things just end up interconnected with each other. Well, let's talk about the the matter of witnesses then. Starting in verse 15, Moses tells the people, one witness is not enough. There needs to be two or three to establish a charge. So let's talk about the witnesses. Yeah, so uh, th this is a, a fairly big topic in the in the scriptures of the of the witness and the false witness, and especially that... Uh, things need to be confirmed by more than one person. Um, may, maybe the, the the clearest place to see this uh, is in Matthew 18, where if if your brother sins against you, you go to them personally, and if they refuse to repent, then you bring two or three, or you bring you bring um, yeah two or three witnesses with you to urge urge them to repent. And if they don't repent, now you have the witnesses that yes, they've sinned and they're non-repentant. And that's when they're handed over to, uh, to the church and, and whatnot from there. But you also have this even in like our Lord's own death, right? So the, the, 
the whole kind of sham trials that are being set up by the uh, by the Pharisees and the, and, the, and the ruling class is that they're trying to find witnesses to testify against Jesus. And one of the things that happens is they can't find anybody. They can't find two guys to agree. And, uh, and so they would have, you know, a couple of guys that would come up and they, they would say, you know, that he, he said that he would, uh, destroy this temple and on the third day, rise it back up. But on this, even this, they couldn't agree. So that, like they, they weren't getting the details the same. And so there was no way that they could actually condemn him because you didn't have enough witnesses. And so this is where, why it's important that Jesus actually witnesses against himself at the trial, because now you've got all the witnesses, right? And that's why they say, what need do we have of further testimony? But you have this even like in who is Jesus? Well, you have the witness of the father and the Holy Spirit at his baptism. And you have the witness of St. John the Baptist. You have the witness at his transfiguration of Peter, James, and John, as well as the voice of the father. So over and over you get the wit, you get multiple witnesses, two or three witnesses of who Jesus is throughout the gospel. So that what was really interesting is that the Lord in his incarnation places himself under the very laws that he's given to Israel, right? Yeah, that, no, that is, it's quite striking how these matters of witnesses come up both in the ministry of our Lord and then in his passion, as you said. So there needs to be two or three witnesses. In verse 16, it seems to provide a, a slightly different situation where there's this malicious witness or a violent witness. And, and it sounds like maybe it's just one person against another. There is the potential that they both end up going before the Lord, you know, that matter of where the judges were and going to the, the place where the Lord would establish that. That was brought up previously in Deuteronomy. What's the situation that comes up starting in verse 16? Um. So, so there's, yeah. So, I mean, we, we all know how this goes, right? This is like a, he said, she said sort of deal. So there, there's some sort of uh, personal conflict that happens and, um, uh, there, there's no one that's a, that's a witness to what happened or may not have happened. And so in this case, you're going to come before the Lord through the priests and the judges who are in office, right? So the, the officials that the Lord has put in place, uh, think, I mean, the state essentially, uh, mm. and it, they are going to inquire. They're, they're going to dig at the facts of the case and figure, try and figure out who's lying and who's not lying. But one of the things that's set in place to, to, uh, to, to kind of fight against some sort of a false witness and just coming up like, you know, what's to prevent me from just coming up and, uh, and accusing you of some awful crime. Well, if I am a false witness, then whatever I was trying to have done to you as a false witness, um, or as, as a, as a crime that I said you committed against me as a false witness, I'm then going to have that placed back upon me. And so that's the, uh, so like if I'm trying to do something that would result in you uh, being put to death, well, then the result of me being found out as false witness is that I'm put to death. Well, that, it turns out that that is a pretty good way of um, discouraging people from coming up as false witnesses. Mostly, I mean, it doesn't completely get away, get, get rid of it. But, you know, most people are going to think twice before coming up and trying to falsely accuse somebody else. Hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. One of the things that, that stands out to me from this text is when you look at the way this text is totally ignored and abused in the the trial that Jesus is that he receives in the gospels. I mean, it's it's amazing how how many different ways they go against this text. About the only thing that they even try to get right is they they want two witnesses. Yeah, for some reason they they want to have the two witnesses, but everything else about it, they seem to to ignore. It, it really goes to show the, the actual injustice that the Lord received according to Deuteronomy. And yet, as he, as we've ta- already said, the, the justice that God gave through the, the innocent blood that was shed there, it, it's quite striking yet again to see how this comes into play in our Lord's passion. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's all, it's all sorts of, of false witnesses. And, and in fact, I mean, this, this shows up, um, in the, uh, uh, in, in Naboth's vineyard, 
um, uh, it, it says that, uh, uh, Jezebel, uh, finds, uh, two worthless men to sit opposite of Naboth. That, that's how they're described. Um, yeah. uh, two, two men who, um, uh, who don't care about God's law, don't care about the community or Naboth or, or anything like that. Um, it, and it, and it doesn't really say what's going to happen. You, you imagine that they're probably getting paid for this. Um, they're, they're kind of false witnesses for hire, so to speak. And they're not worried for whatever reason about, um, about getting falsely, uh, recognized as a false witness. But the issue there is that there's two of them, right? So, so in Naboth's vineyard, um, Jezebel at least understands that there needs to be two witnesses that agree. And so they get their story straight and they come and they, uh, testify against, uh, Naboth in public. And so Naboth's put to death, uh, on account of this because it's two, not one. And the general assumption is that if you've got two witnesses to something, then they're telling the truth. Um, and that, that again goes, goes back to, um, what is just so incredible about the trial with Jesus is they, they can't find two people to agree. Um, right. and, and it's like, they're, they're so, uh, they're so intent on destroying him that they can't even take the time to um, get their story straight on, on what he needs to be destroyed for. They, they're just completely losing their minds. And so Jesus finally takes it into his own hands, but it's also what he promised would happen, right? So that the um, he, as the good shepherd, is going to lay down his own life. Nobody takes it from him. He lays it down of his own accord. He's he's going to be the one ultimately that is going to decide, no, it's time for me to go to my death. I'm going to witness against myself. Um, and, and in that case, like there, there's no, um, there's no need for other witnesses. The last verse of our text today is one that is perhaps very familiar for a variety of reasons, maybe not all of them scriptural, but it does show up here in the scriptures and it shows up in other places in the Old Testament too. The, your eye shall not pity. We heard that previously in verse 13. In verse 21 of the text, Moses continues, it shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Why, why is this the command that the Lord gives here? Yeah. So, um, there, there's a couple of things going on here. Uh, one, if, if there is, if, if you read, um, like the, the texts on how the Jews actually put this stuff into practice, um, it wasn't just straight up. Like if somebody poked out your eye, then your eye is going to be poked out. It, it, it didn't actually work out that way. Um, if something resulted in the loss of life in, in the killing of another person, intentionally, uh, that resulted in you also being killed. That was actually the punishment for it. But what, what's being set up here is a, uh, a standard by which you're not, uh, over punishing or under punishing that that's the, the general standard that's being put here. So for example, if you go and you steal an apple, the punishment isn't life in prison, right? That, that, that punishment does not match the severity of the crime. And also, likewise, if you go and you kill your neighbor in um, in anger and intentionally, uh, the punishment is not, um, you know, probation. That, that there's on both sides, you're you're not uh, you're you're doling out a proper justice for the crime that is committed, and and that's the thing that is um, mo- that this text is most concerned about. So, and this goes again to what we were saying earlier, the human tendency to let vengeance reign and take over the Lord protects it from, protects us from that so that justice actually is carried out. What else? I mean, this is, you know, this life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, as you said, it's not necessarily, well, it it wasn't always like, it's not that you actually lost your hand. There was a penalty sometimes that would have been equivalent to losing your hand. When you look at the way this is practiced. How about the ways that, I mean, you mentioned the Sermon on the Mount earlier. This factors into the Sermon on the Mount. So, so how does this, how does this still come into play for Christians? Yeah. So, uh, Luther has this really interesting thing in his lectures on Deuteronomy, um, where he talks about the allegorical meaning of, 
the text and he gets into this. And one of the things that he's talking about is how um, uh, for false teachers that um, the, the, the punishment, he, he deals specifically with false teachers here, that, that the punishment the Lord is going to met out on false teachers uh, for their false teaching is going to match the crime. So the, if, you know, if they are um, uh, bearing false witness about God, um, not witnessing properly about God. If they're uh, destroying people with uh, false doctrine, that is, you know, uh, destroying their faith or not giving them the ability to come to faith because they're giving them faith in the wrong things, that the Lord is ultimately going to destroy them uh, for that in the end. Um, but that there's a almost a sort of gradation, uh, Luther seems to indicate on this, that, um, you know, if, if there is, you know, maybe a lesser, um, a, a, a lesser teaching, so to speak, on like you know, uh, what sort of angels there are, or something like this, that that's not necessarily going to result in um, eternal punishment uh, for that, because there there's actually even in in this a um, a justice with which the Lord is going to operate, and for us when we when we deal with one another. Um, that we deal with one another uh, in an appropriate way. So if um, if you sin against me, um, the manner in which we deal with that is not uh, apart from seeking reconciliation and forgiveness. That's always the case. But the the practical um, and and worldly way in which we're going to deal with that is not always going to be the same. It's going to match whatever the, the sin was. Uh, so for example, if, um, uh, if, if your sin against me is that, you know, you, you borrowed my lawnmower and you, uh, you know, destroyed it in the process and then, you know, didn't buy me a new one or whatever to, to replace it. Um, you know, the, I would take very good care of your lawn. I, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure you would. Um, I like mowing lawns. <laughs> Uh, you can come mow, mow ours. Uh, <laughs> so, but the, the, uh, uh you know, the, the punishment for that, so to speak, the manner in which we're going to deal with that is that I'm just not going to loan you my stuff anymore. Right. So, so there, there is a punishment that occurs temporally in this, um, in addition to the fact that we've been reconciled and forgiven. Uh, so, so that, uh, again, the, the overarching thing that's going on with all of this is that, uh, the manner in which we deal with each other is going to be uh, appropriate to what's actually happened, right? That we don't overreact or, or underreact uh, to what's going on and that we always deal with each other uh, through uh, mercy and forgiveness. Well, I, I, yeah, I think that's really a key that we deal with each other in mercy and forgiveness. And if I can bring up something you mentioned toward the beginning of our conversation, that there is no, there's no place in here for personal vengeance. You know, we are we are talking here about the actions of the the state as it existed for the people of Israel, and so there there is a difference then between the you know the the way that the state carries out this justice that is good and right, the way that it looks like in my own personal interactions is ruled by mercy, forgiveness, that desire to be reconciled, even if even if there are certain consequences that remain on this side of heaven, that, that desire for mercy and reconciliation to forgive as I have been forgiven is what reigns for me personally, rather, rather than just letting my vengeance run wild and do what it would, which would certainly lead me into further sin. Right. And, and that's, I mean, like we've talked about that, that is, that is the thing that ultimately is going on, not only here, but with all the commandments that they are, um, that they're in essence, they are protecting us from ourselves. They're protecting our neighbors, uh, from ourselves. Um, and they are seeking to direct us to live in a godly way, um, acting in, like we said, acting in mercy, acting in forgiveness, uh, not acting in pride not acting in haughtiness. The, these are the, these major sins that show up, especially in the Old Testament, that that lead to the destruction um, of entire groups of people. Um, and and the Lord is is guarding us against those things um, in part by just setting up uh, these these barriers so that we don't even get close to them. 
right? So, so it's like setting up a, a fence around, you know, some, uh, some important object so that, you know, you want to make sure that people aren't coming up and like hitting the object with a bat or something like that. Well, you put up a, a fence a hundred yards out Well, they don't even get close to it. And now, you know, you, you come up, there's this fence. Well, it's a lot of work to get through the fence and, you know, you might get caught as you're running up to the, to the big tower or whatever it might be. So you just don't even do it. Right. So, so it curbs our, our natural inclination to, to act in this way. Um, and that's for our good and that's for our neighbor's good. Um, so that we actually live a, uh, good and decent and holy life as the Lord has, uh, instituted for us. Uh, and it turns out that that's just overall a better life. I mean, you look at all these things that are, that are listed out here and it's pretty easy to see that, you know, not, uh, not unjustly punishing someone for, um, you know, because the ax had slipped off their, their ax handle and killed somebody that that's a good way for society to function. Not stealing your neighbor's land is a good way for society to function. Not bearing false witness against your neighbor is a good way for society to function like over and over and over. It's just like society functions best when these things are in place. And so the Lord just over and over is giving us these things, um, for that. And, uh, and right next to that, he's giving us Jesus who is, um, who's, as we've seen is, is here in all of these texts and, uh, taking that the sin that is being committed and the fullness of these things into himself and, and dying for it. So that when we do sin against one another, when we do trespass against these commandments and sin against God as well, uh, that there is the blood of Christ, uh, uh, still speaking a better word than the blood of Abel and forgiving us in the process. Pastor Sean Kilgo is pastor at Redeemer Lutheran Church in Lawrence, Kansas, helping us today with Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 1 to 21. Pastor Kilgo, thanks for being our guest today. It's great to be here. The Lord gives his law. It is good and wise, as the hymn reminds us. He provides for true justice for his people. He puts limits to where our sinful vengeance would carry us, and instead, through his word, shows us what it looks like to have a life ordered according to his word, according to true justice. And he has given justice to us, justification through his son, Jesus Christ. His innocent blood was shed to purge the guilt from us, to cover us in his holiness and righteousness that we might be his children. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about Deuteronomy, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. We always love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.